All right, let's go ahead and shift our focus to our next panel titled, Scaling Innovation, Overcoming Obstacles and Leveraging Synergies in New Markets. This session will unravel the complexities of growing innovative ventures. How do businesses scale up without losing their innovative edge? So without wasting time, let's give it up for our moderator, Eric Reiner, owner of Be Well Innovation, and our panelists. Let's greet them to the stage. All right, Daisy, this is going to be exciting. Scaling innovation is near and dear to my heart. I think I'll, I'll, I'll sit here, you all go that way. And before I jump in, I just want to talk about innovation in general. We all know that the pace of innovation is increasing. We're in the sixth phase in, of innovation right now in the United States, according to the number of patents being filed. The challenge is it's not always equitable, accessible, and it doesn't always meet the customer needs. So the pace of change might be going really quickly, but people cannot necessarily change as fast as that pace of innovation. So we're going to talk about practical methods and tools and ideas to help you actually scale innovation and deliver it to real-world customers and real-world use cases. So I'll give everybody a chance to introduce themselves, and I'll start with myself. I'm Eric Reiners. I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called Be Well Innovation, and we help corporate athletes get more joy, meaning, and impact out of their lives. And what I mean by that is, how do you do your best work, the best work of your life, and feel really good at the same time? And we use neuroscience and sports science-based protocols to do that. And so it's relatively new in the corporate space. I left the cybersecurity domain about, I spent about 13 years in cybersecurity, and I witnessed a lot of colleagues responding to high-profile security incidents and sometimes burning out and, uh, and doing their best work but coming at the expense of their mental and physical health. So we're trying to create a new way of working that helps you do your best work and feel really good at the same time. And the way I think about innovation, I'll hand it over to all you to introduce yourselves and your organization and define innovation first. That'll be our first question. For me, uh, working in cybersecurity, innovation always meant outpacing the attackers. Attackers were innovating faster than the defenders could keep up. And so for us, it was just pure survival. Innovation was necessary to stay on top of what was happening in the, in the threat landscape. And I'll hand it over to you, Satya. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Satya Krishnaswamy. I'm founder and president of Chain Aim. My background has been, I've been playing roles of an entrepreneur inside a company running innovation studios, practices, uh, mass challenge, matter, uh, many innovation hubs around the world, uh, working with many labs and things like that. But mm, short story, uh, with all this, what I've, to me, innovation right now is, is a force for leveling the playing field. It has always been, and at this juncture, it is the scale at which the emerging of uh, technologies open up new business processes. And uh, we are kind of uh, studying emerging tech and what it means to the business processes in different verticals. That's what we do with Jay. All right. Um, hi, my name is Esther, and I'm from the other part of the world. I'm from Malaysia, but I've spent quite a bit of my time about close to 10 years in New Zealand, and some parts of my life in Singapore. So currently based half in Malaysia, half in Singapore. So I'm, um, I'm, a, you know, I'm an entrepreneur um, from COVID time. So the business that I'm running right now is a COVID baby. So um, it's about four years now. I'm running an international business and management consulting company um, for that region, um, particularly aiming in the Asia Pacific region. So we help companies to look at new ways um, entering to new markets, um, going in and coming, um, going out and coming in. And so, Eva, if you come, you know, through that this part of the world, I'm happy to look at how we can, you know, strike partnerships and collaborate as well. So, um, also one part of the other business is also in the area of people, you know, help companies to look at people's strategies and also um, the cultures and implement, uh, yeah, implement strategies and programs. So what innovation um, literally means to us is um, a lot to do with how do we make competition irrelevant and also how do we then turn competitors into collaborators. So it's something that I um, really, really love to focus on. All right. Thank you. <laughs> well, good morning. I'm Gary Michelle. Um, I uh, do advisory and uh, 
uh, mostly advisory work uh, with, uh, with companies, leaders, and investors uh, around transformation uh, and growth. Um, I am a former CEO. I have worked in a number of different businesses over my career, uh, working mostly on transformation, uh, looking at businesses that need to get from point A to point B, and, uh, and working on philosophy to do that. Um, I recently published a book called Decomplify, which talks a lot about my philosophy about um, simplifying processes and relationships um, in, in, in your leadership style in order to, uh, to innovate and to transform businesses. Uh, when I think about uh, innovation, I think about challenging the status quo and pushing the boundaries of what is, what is, what is capable. Um, but it's also, it's not just about good ideas or insights, it's also about execution and making sure that we're, we're executing those ideas, those concepts, those abilities, uh, so that we're creating value for customers as well as for stakeholders in a business. Thanks, Gary. My name is Vincent Allen. I founded and run a company called Bob Industries. We are at our core, we're a production consulting company, so we do a lot of, of you know, traditional production, you know, like, like camera action kind of stuff, but also uh, significant amounts of live streaming. I started working in live streaming at the very beginning of the industry in the late 90s and early 2000s, and I've been building those systems ever since. But we also do a lot of consulting with various entities, you know, financial firms. Everyone wants a TV studio in, the, in their office nowadays. Everyone wants something that you can go live on CNBC and talk about the state of the market, or whatever, and so we consult on those levels and build those kind of systems. I uh, recently built a system that got Barclay, for example. Uh, uh, but in terms of innovation, I think um, for me and for our business, innovation is the fine art of, of seeing what's coming without losing your footing in what's next, right? And, and so you, I said this in a previous panel, but it's sort of like the, from the old Westerns that, you know, the cowboy has got his ear to the ground or the railroad track kind of listening for, is a stampede coming? is a, a train coming down the track. And I think kind of, the, and we're seeing that as all of these different markets that five or 10 years ago were completely separated and have all converged to one sense or another. We all have to be able to, to embrace the notion that technology is going to rule the day, uh, whether that's AI or anything else, and, and, and understand and accept that this ground is constantly going to be shifting underneath our feet. And what worked yesterday may not work today. And, and being able to see that and build, to, like you said, Gary, Wrap that in the process, right? Because if you're in business, if you don't have a process, you are just gesticulating wildly and just trying to throw it all against the wall and see what is there. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Anjil Agarwal. I'm a CEO of NJ Fine. So I actually have a, a unique perspective, and I like that part which Vincent said, you know, what you have today may not be tomorrow. I'm a true example of this. So I, I had a bachelor's in textile, master's from NIFT, like fashion designing. So my father always wanted, you know, in India, like one kid to be an engineer, other to be a doctor. So when <laughs> I was experimenting, so I saw a cockroach and I fainted. So they said, okay, you are an engineer. So and the, my uh, younger brother ended up becoming a doctor. So as an engineer, so the only college I got selected was a textile because I was like always not studying. So when I became a textile engineer, I saw the big machinery. I was like scared because I was like the timid from like, you know, city where we don't even yell. So I said, no, 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 this textile industry not for me. So I moved to fashion, like ladies clothes and all. So in ladies clothes, when I was there, I was the only boy in a class of 18. So I was like, you know, and my, the thing was, my name was A.A. A. Anil Agarwal. My parents picked that name. So I was always end up uh, like screaming up with a girl. So, and my mother said, you know, if you kiss anyone, that girl you are married technically. So I couldn't kiss anyone. So it was like, from that stage, now I do flips and I do uh, foreclosures uh, and I became financial all because no one told me, like Vincent told me today, what you have today may not be tomorrow. So I got laid off in 2017 as a, a director global for Macy's. At that time, no one told me what to do because the only thing I knew was like passion. So it was very hard for me. That The word innovation is very well reflection of me because no one that time like was supporting only my wife because... So luckily, you know, thank God to her because she took care of her running the show in my house and giving me privilege to go out and do what I wanted. So when I was uh, going out, 
only thing i figured out like i can do because there is nothing else i can do the company they were hiring me they were giving me one fourth of salary i used to make and then i had no idea except for dot com and gmail that's it so i was like you know how i if i go to anyone they were asking money and i have no money right now and best thing the best thing happened the, the department as handling private label for macy that's the only department they filed a bankruptcy and then uh, my 401k became almost like 100000 so i was like what how i going to do 100000 and that too uh, when they fired me that time we had a baby and we bought a big house so all the troubles landed up my sister in law my daughter in law they were all like in my house and i was like how i going to tell them that i have no job so from that time i decided innovation innovation so what i did now i run a company where i find entrepreneurs like me and my mantra of success is because my mission is now educating and empowering families and uh, home owners by educating them uh, educating them about like health wealth and home ownership so and this all started because when i start became myself i made myself as like no man or like a small wheel of a big wheel so anyone who has a big vision dream i started going to them and telling them hey instead of when i was messes my attitude was here i have to so come to me don't touch me i'm like a monoxious nasty guy i have a lot of degrees i'm the top notch i make it plus so no one can touch the minute i got ground zero my attitude changed because the one girl told me sir and this is a very powerful statement <laughs> and that girl i met uh, like not in us like that was an asian girl and i i don't even remember where i met and she told me sir uh, you know what you have to become uh, instead of here i am you have to become there you are i suppose that you know so neil that uh, innovation to you is like figuring out where you need to be now yeah so that's how my innovation is i love the organic story there so <laughs> let's keep moving because we've got to talk about quite a few topics here i uh, love the stories on this panel this is great the um, we talk a little bit about process there and i really want to focus on culture because you can stifle innovation or you can encourage it in your cultures i love the organic process and sometimes it comes out of nowhere so after i'd love to kick it off to you and just like How do you create and sustain a culture of innovation, and how do you think about that? Do you hire for it? Do you train? Like, if there's some ideas there. Yeah, no, excellent. Um, great question. All right, so um, it's coming back to what innovation, like you know, Steve Jobs says, you know, innovation distinguishes between leaders, le leaders and followers, right? So um, I personally think you know, innovation's got a lot to do, um, you know, with leadership as well. You know, like um, so when it comes to how do we foster, you know, this sort of culture. got a lot to do with um how do we you know implement it um, you know through you know through the different um you know environment that we're creating in the organization so um you know Peter Drucker says you know the uh, best way to predict future is to create it right? so creating an environment and uh, nurturing an environment that encourages you know innovate innovative mindset it's crucial because um a lot of times when we i mean talking back to you know whether we hire or whether we train for it but um you know we'll have to start with you know creating an environment and this environment often starts from leadership right and uh, in the organization our leaders would want to start um you know if they see a need um you know people see uh, people do what people see so it's very important that this environment um that encourages risk taking you know encourages um failure right um failure is the one that you know um help us to you know transform setback into a step up right or setback into a huge comeback so um yeah creating an environment for it but coming back to that i also agree like you know it starts from hiring also you know like a strategic like create a strategic hiring strategy like we don't only focus on just hiring and looking at technical skills well it's important while we look at that but um you know hiring beyond that you know hiring skills um well skill sets that helps to expand thinking right critical thinking um you know um skill sets um that you know nurtures the innovative mindset so it's got a lot to do with the nurturing of the mindset as well so how do we then evaluate that right of course that's a totally different topic but um has got a lot to do with finding out um um well people always say success starts from hiring you know um, hiring the right person at your doorstep. So, um hiring is also uh, very important, but I also think you know, then after hiring, what's next, right? Uh, you want, you need the continuous learning. So, it's actually both. Um you know, it's very important to um continuously nurture that learning um posture because 
um, a lot of people are being promoted because we're really, really good and the technical skills that we have. But then how do we then continuously bring that value and be able to continuously bring the best that they may not even think that they have, you know, and bring out of them. Um, that's really through, you know, the nurturing and through the learning and through the training. Yeah, so to answer that, um, I think, yeah, a mix of those both, but also then it comes through leadership. How do we then um, foster those leadership skills, you know, in the environment? Because everything rises and falls in leadership. So, yeah, so I hope that answers to your little that's question. I I, if I could yeah. just piggyback on that yeah. before we can have a culture, innovation, the first thing you have to have is a cultural volition, right? Because you can come in and you can be the most innovative person in the world and you go into the, the wrong company that that is, it, this is the way we do. This is the way we, we make, make the widget, same process all the time. You can put forward all these ideas and then no one's listening to you. And then eventually what happens, right, is those really talented people that you mentioned, they leave, right? If they go somewhere else where they're going to be respected and that people are going to empower them to say, hey, I've got an idea for how we can do this or that. Can we try something? And, and you know, I think about, when we talked about this often. We had a meeting the other day, just go over some things we want to talk about. Think about the film 28 Days Later, right? And, and the company Canon, and when they created the XO1 in the late 90s, how that revolutionized everything we did in the production industry. And then when, when the producers of the film 28 Days Later had the vision to say, let's shoot this film differently, and they were able to get all these cameras together, and instead of doing one or two angles, you know, take one, take two, take 40, they sh every every scene in that movie was shot on 28 different angles. I'm curious, was that a leadership decision or was that the team? <laughs> that? That's a pretty cool, like the technology was there, but no one decided. Well, no one was doing it, yeah. right? Because there was all of this debate at the time about whether with digital you were ever going to be able to get, it sounds silly now, in 2024, <laughs> no, but back better. then there was this whole debate about whether a digital process mm -hmm was ever going to be able to give you the resolution and the color saturation, because you're replacing the chemical process, right, with a digital one, whether or not you were ever going to be able to get there to audiences that were conditioned to expect that grainy film mm. look, and people were like, oh, we can't get there. And what changed was this film, but then also the way we edited, there were created plugins that could simulate that grainy no. look, so you got the best of both worlds, right? Well, that was change management a little bit. Like, oh, it absolutely was. <laughs> absolutely change uh, management. So with the, the pace of digital change was super fast and it was accessible, Yeah. but it wasn't being used yet for some reason until this was proven to show. Uh, Gary, yeah, if I could just come back to the culture piece for yeah, just absolutely. a minute or tie it up a little bit. Um, you know, I believe that you know the pe people doing the work in our organizations know best how to do the work. They know where the opportunities, where the problems are, where the opportunities are. Yeah. They also know how to fix it. It's up to us as leaders yeah. to be in a position to create that culture that they feel that they, they, can, they can actually achieve that. There are really three things that, 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 that I believe you have to have in that culture. And as leaders, we have to communicate. That's the, you know, the safety, first of all, to have that environment that you talked about where we can ask the questions, we can answer, we can try things. Um, and you know, we can even fail and then learn from that and, and move on. We need to have vulnerability in our organization as well to know that we don't maybe have all the resources and know all the answers, but we allow people in our organization to see that and, and work around that, figure out, hey, let's try this, and if right. it doesn't work, uh, uh, we'll learn from it. And then the other one is purpose, right? We need a direction. We need a, a, a rally cry that uh, the organization can look at and understand that sets us in that direction. What are we trying to achieve? And can everybody, you know, feel it in their heart, know that these are the direction we're going, so that all those resources, all those efforts are pointed in that same direction. That's awesome. Gary, I'm going to stick with you for a little bit. For okay. The next topic, because I know you've written a book on this. Uh, <laughs> so you're one of the experts on the panel, of course. Well, I want to understand, so, and then Sachi, if you could follow, because you've, you've worked in Skunk Works teams within a larger organization, R&D teams. I've had the experience of, you know, trying to isolate innovation to a fast and lean team doing stuff? Or do you create a culture and, and ideas come up anywhere, and then how do you turn them into, you know, something that actually ships? And we're talking about shipping innovation today. And so I would love to know where you find it first. Like, where can this group of business owners and leaders think about finding innovation within their works? Well, I think you find it everywhere, right? You know, first of all, it starts, you know, in, in, uh, you know, in, in asking questions and, and being curious about, 
the world, understanding where things might be going. You know, I, I like to talk about, um, you know, customer-centered innovation a lot. Um, I think that's what a lot of businesses are focused on. We really want to create value for our customers. And I think there's three places that, uh, that, that I find innovation. I think most businesses can find innovation. The first one is obviously around the products and services that we, we naturally, naturally have. How do we expand? How do we move out? How do we, um, we change them, use new technologies or new, new capabilities to, to solve problems around our, our products and services to help our customers move forward is, is one obvious area. A second area for me, though, that, um, that we often you know, kind of leave on the floor, we, we forget about, is, is the buying process for our customers. Are we easy to do business with? Um, have we, you know, do we, are we valuable in that value chain for our customers? Are there ways to change the customer buying process to make it simpler, easier, uh, and faster? And I think you find a lot of innovation there, particularly with new technology, um, you know, taking advantage of that. And I think a third area that, that I like to look at uh, that I think is right for, uh, for innovation is looking at paradigms that exist in the industries or the markets that we serve or we play in today, um, you know, some of the, the industries, uh, you know, we've done it the same way forever. There are unwritten rules to the way we do business uh, or, or the way that we deliver something. And by taking advantage of or looking at those opportunities to change those paradigms uh, is really a place where, where innovation lives. Um, certainly from running larger, you know, being in larger markets, uh, uh, and industries that I've been in in my career, I've seen where you know a lot of competitors are playing by one set of rules for no apparent reason, and all of a sudden somebody somebody finds a way to uh, take advantage of it, yeah. and that's where a lot of these new innovative companies come from. A lot of a lot of companies in this audience come from is taking advantage of those opportunities. So for me, it's those three things: your products and services, the buying process. Uh, taking advantage of paradigms that exist in industries and markets. Interesting, yeah. And Satya, your experience with within orgs working in innovation units, for lack of a better term, but I'd love to hear yeah. like where you find innovation. Yeah, I'll touch upon a little bit of what Gary was talking about. We have been talking about organizations, right? So big organizations have been doing, you know, ingrained innovation across all departments, maybe a separate department inside the company at the periphery. Uh, whatever uh, combinations we were doing, it, it's still getting harder and harder to cope up with the pace of innovation. That's what I've seen uh, within the organizations. But uh, beyond the POCs and pilots, you need to figure out a way to say, is it integral at scale with your operations? That, that's the key element for companies uh, in my mind. Uh, and the second part of it is, uh, I think the reason why I say it is a leveling, uh, leveling the playing field is because it is not just for the big companies even if they are a smaller company, small business, small units, uh, you now have the opportunity to be able to try out new things. And that's what, I, I'll give you an example, right? Uh, mortgage processing, six weeks. Now there are, uh, you know, on-chain mechanisms that can do it in 48 hours. That, that's a huge uh, dimension of, you know, change. Mm. It's just a question of what that, uh, it, what it takes for us to scale this to yeah, yeah. level, right? So the scaling operations is around what the companies did it in a, in a different way. And I'm also seeing another important uh, dynamic, uh, which uh, might be new to, uh, new to uh, some people, which is, which is basically self-organizing units that the Gen Z players are playing. They are truly global, loosely connected guilds, mm -hmm. and not companies. Mm -hmm. So what they are, we are still figuring it out. But people come together on a weekend, they come up with an idea, Monday morning, somebody is funding it, there you go. And so that's the, easier when you're a small organization, right? It's a small if you're three people, people in a garage, you can do that, or three people in different countries even. The, the, the part, yeah. the, what is surprising me is, uh, these, these treasuries of some of these foundations are bigger than what even bigger companies can mm -hmm. do. But so something the, to, would we agree? I'm curious that Neil on your starting a new company and and Vincent too. Like, would you agree that as you get bigger, it gets harder to innovate, or would you throw that throw that out? Well, I think that I mean, certainly, it's much harder to steer a large vessel than a small one. Yeah. Right. I think the what the things you have to do 
uh, we're running a big company in order to you know make payroll and do all you've got all these people that work for you and you have to have processes if you've got five thousand people working for you and you don't have everything wrapped in a process and a change management like this 48 hour mortgage thing right that can no, no, I, every <laughs> other department if you don't have a process with a large company then it, it will be chaos yeah. Yeah. right so i think with a small company you're, you're you're able to be much more nimble in yeah. terms of what's important to you and where you want to spend the dollars right um, I think that the thing that a lot of people have done over like the last 10 years is you have a lot of huge companies like JP Morgan Chase who will have these these skunk works or like you know, SEAL team kind of squads where you've got two guys from IT, and two guys from data science and, you know, just on and on and on and where they create a small business unit that's pulling various different verticals that creates that small company feel. So it's with, still a yeah. cross-functional effort, but with a yeah. kind of a... Team pulled together. 100. percent We saw uh, those fusion teams. Yeah, and Neil, what do you think? Luckily, you know, uh, uh, because the panel is a mix of um, different fields, so I'm like SMB right now, like small scale right now. But what happened is because I was working for a big corporation, so there we had a big CRM, we had multiple teams meeting, so all of a sudden it became like me, and you said like garage, right? So only motivation I had was like X stories of X people, like they start to garage and all the stuff, and plus the aging and the family. So in my situation. I learned like, instead of employees, because I was an employee, I started banking on entrepreneurs. So I cut down that parameter totally, like, you know, I don't want to hire. So in my company, we do Millet Plus now, but there's no employees. So everything is in a CRM. So we use a free tool, like HubSpot. So now the HubSpot I use for my real estate. But the beauty is now, because I was in the clothing industry, so same HubSpot, now I give it to the clothing industry as a consultant. The companies who basically were using different software, I use the same software. You built a product. So you could, you know. No, using the same product, but customize it for the clothing industry because I used it for myself. So HubSpot, I was showing it to the outside someone, you know, how you can scan a business card, how you can send an email, how you can create a CRM using a free tool, right? So now on that part, I'm not dependent on any employee. Now, third thing I learned when because it's always uh, cost effective to retain a, a person rather than training. So training is very expensive. You know, when you train an employee and you were asking, right, how you retain them, you know, if you don't do it, like just to them, they're going to go, right? So now the training part needs thinking like people like you need to be sitting who can understand the employee. What if you have a nasty boss, you don't, he's just thinking about his boss uh, position. He might let that employee go, right, because he took a wrong decision. He might hire someone like, you know, it. so I am banking on entrepreneurs. I slice myself in a matrix. And I divide, and I, wherever I see a project uh, using innovation, I using an entrepreneur, we come up uh, using a tools which are available. Uh, so you're bringing in outside expertise. To expertise, complement yeah. Your yeah, ability. complement, yeah. yeah. That's Those who are already trained. Yeah. So I am cutting down the cost of training. As I said, cost of training is very expensive. So I hire yeah. talented people, and I make them a part of my company, and then we create a LLC, and they are partners with me. And that's how we nurture it, and then we look for someone to buy us, you know. And then we go to next one. If I could just follow up on that real quick, Eric. I think that we talked about big versus large. The challenge is when you're a big entity, you have things like compliance boards, yeah. right? And depending yeah. on what your line of business is, you have governmental regulation that if you're in finance or law or medicine or things like this, that preclude you from making those kinds of choices. Yeah. Like if you are a large bank, can't just that there there is a background check, yeah, you, yeah. you know, a security process that one has government to that one has so to it's go designed through. to be slower. It, it's designed to be slow on purpose yeah. to protect people from like the Bernie Madoff sort of yeah. thing, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you, it, it's much harder in a large organization, depending on what your vertical is, to be nimble in that same to that degree. Yeah. But there's but there's it's in every organization. Not every organization. Not every not every. Uh, commercial enterprise is that highly regulated. Sure. They regulate themselves. It becomes a risk management type of a, yep. Uh, yep. A, a of an environment. 100%. And you've got people. You've got people that have different styles. You have groups of different different styles of change within a business. And what you've got to do is make sure that you have that you know have that direction, have that purpose set right, so that everybody understands what you're doing and start eliminating those areas. Yeah. Part of part of innovation. Is eliminating that you know that 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 girth right that yeah. that uh, you know the shackles that keep you mm -hmm. from being able to grow, keep being able to lead your organization, right. and, and and being able to deliver. At the end of the day, it's all problem solving, yeah. right? What problem are we trying to solve, and for whom, right? Yeah, right. And if we work at that as as a team, owner, then you you, you 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 can get there. Yeah, let me check. Uh, Carlos, we got fifteen. Okay. 
but I'm gonna. Uh, you can go real quick. How about yeah, it? The, the final point about where, where are we move this is the question. Mm. That becomes important because that landscape is also changing. Right? Mm. It was used to be websites, then mobile apps, but now they are communities. Mm. So that's a very interesting change. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Works. You can start a movement now. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't need an organization either. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's move on to our next and yeah. second to last question, everyone. I know you're really excited about that. <laughs> Third day of the conference. Okay, we're going to get practical here. I would like to actually talk about scaling to real-world customer problems. And uh, and Sachi, why don't you leave this one and start with like an example of how you put something into the you shipped it. Customers took it up. Maybe they even provided input on the way. Mm -hmm. And like, what was the time to market on that? And how did you actually get it done? Yeah. So. Uh, from a company perspective, let me tackle that, right? So you really, once you do the pilots and the POCs, uh, you really need to have a real operational problem, and that's where companies stop, 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 and then they go into a circle, right? Yeah, some items are going to be regulatory, but find the conducive problem where you can to scale first, and then say, is this relating to my CFO? Is, is, is my CFO answered adequately? That's a very important question. Is my CO adequately, uh, adequately answered, right? So don't, don't chase just because a piece of technology can do something. That doesn't mean much. You need to have multiple angles. And some of the work that we did about it, we, there was a discovery framework we did around that. And then it helped us saying, if I do it in this business unit and this business unit, this is good enough for us to make a bigger decision. So it's like an internal beta, almost like a validation of it's the... It's a stage net is what we call yeah. it. It's yeah. like a replica production type of a thing. Yeah. Uh, and then it is just a switch. It's an AV switch to, 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 to do what next type of thing. The only thing is, if you're needing digital engagement, then you'll have to make up your ways of saying, okay, where are the users? Where are the customers? And that's the other angle that you have to kind of keep on. Excellent. Esther, can you add, you're, you're innovating in people strategy, yeah. marketing, a lot of different areas. Like, how do, you, how do you ship something quickly and test it and understand if there's a customer need there and then scale out when there is? Yeah, I mean, it's coming to that, right? Like, um, I think one other area, um, a few areas that have been talked about, like, you know, product, customers, and all that, right? I think one other area um, is also, you know, um, through research, right? Um, I know, just finding out, you know, through surveys, through research, through through building relationships, I think relationships are very, very important. Um, you know, it's who you know in the market as well. Like, you know, sometimes um, it's the people that will help you to get there, right? Like, you know, through customers, but it's customers will give you the feedback that will be able to help you to be able to not do the same thing again and again because sometimes you want to innovate, you need to find new ways of doing new things, right? And so, I mean, that's, that's one way. Um, the other way is also, you know, strike collaboration. Right. Um, I mean, it can be in-house, you know, um, you know um, encourage, you know, cross-functional sort of collaboration, but also, you know, if it's sure. through customers, right? Like, we can start, um, like, we just, instead of viewing competitors, how do we then turn them into collaborators no, as well, yeah. right? So, um, so co through collaboration, through strategic partnership, I think it's also one great way to be able to then look into new ways of doing things because they could be really good in this area that, we, that, um, that we're not so good at and how do we then leverage um, synergy and how do we then strike partnerships to be able to then, um, yeah, skill innovation in one area. Yeah. So the third area that I'm also thinking is also um, leveraging a new market, right? I mean, this topic is also about scaling innovation into new markets. Well, um, one market could be very strong in one area. Like, so for instance, like in America, technology is really strong. Right. Right. And then from the area that I'm from, like, you know, in Malaysia, um, it's um, a totally different area. We're probably very strong in agriculture, for instance. <laughs> so how do we then leverage, you know, the synergies? And then how do we then strike collaborations, start partnerships, and then, you know, um, move forward together? So I, mean, I guess Excellent. that's... Thanks. Eric, Eric, real quick, I think that we're talking about how you in this particular question, how we scale this, right? Yeah, like approved practical strategies yeah. for this. And, and so I think there. one of the things I always think about when you talk about, when you hear you talking about, all this is really problem solving, right? Mm -hmm. And when I was running AV at um, uh, WW Weight Watchers at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the things that Mindy Grossman, who was the CEO there at the time, used to always say was never waste a good crisis, right? Yeah. Like, like just get, someone's going to come to you with a problem at some point that is like, 
could potentially be devastating for your business model, mm-hmm. right? Like in WW at the time, it was everyone's at home. Their, their model was people go into the studios and do their stuff. And so we had to figure out how to do that virtually. And so you don't waste a good crisis when there is a problem. Yeah. It's easy to get bored or C-suite buy-in when they're like, well, this is going to cost us $200,000 this quarter. Can we spend seventy five to fix it? Yeah, <laughs> that forces and so it's like you don't way. waste that. And then you get that buy-in. You're able to build those Skunk Works teams and ship a product. Like we ship their virtual their virtual interface in seven days. Yeah, you were and forced to. Yeah. That, that's, so <laughs> so there's something there you go. Yeah. There's something called the inspiration paradox. Your brains are actually more creative and inspired when you're tired. You ever notice this on a Friday afternoon, you're kind of daydreaming? <laughs> or you go out for a walk and suddenly you come up with an idea. Is there, do you uh, have one? Do we have time for a quick story based on that? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, don't well, wait let me finish the inspiration paradox though, first. So if you want to do strategy, and then I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, yeah, if you want to do strategy, do it on Fridays instead of Mondays. In the mm-hmm. afternoon when you're kind of tired, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to – you're going to help pay your answer to everything is don't do it on Monday, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, go ahead, Gary. Yeah, I was just saying, don't waste a good crisis. Uh, you know, I, when I ran uh, uh, Club Car, the golf car company, I uh, took it over at the end of 2007, beginning of 2008. Everybody was having a good year at the beginning of 2008, if anybody remembers it. But um, uh, the golf car business was, you know, had a record year in 2007. We're looking at incoming orders at the beginning of 2008. And all of a sudden, you know, they, they just weren't there. And, um, you know, we all know what happened later. The Great Recession, you know, hit by October of that year. People weren't buying golf cars, and we were in the golf car business. And we, uh, we, we used that as an opportunity to go ask questions of our, our customers. Hey, what's your biggest problem? We know you're not going to buy golf cars. How can we help you solve your biggest problem? You know, same problems they always have, right? We've got to cut costs. We need to increase our revenue. We have to provide a quality service. We need to differentiate ourselves. And from that was born the marriage of using, uh, using technology. In that, in that case, using GPS technology can, coupled with the controls of, of, of the golf car to control where a car could go, where it could move. Now, think about this. The iPad and the iPhone had not come out yet. Put a touch screen inside a golf car with amenities for the golfer and a point-of-sale device in there. All of that came out just like, you know, you prompted me to the Weight Watcher story. Um, all of that came out. A new product was born and a new category of a product and also a way to sell a product. In that case, it was a, it was a SaaS type model before we knew what that was. Um, but we were able to put that in there and create differentiation for our company uh, versus our competitors by solving the problems our customers were asking. It had nothing to do with the golf car itself. It had everything to do with, um, with, uh, with them being able to increase their revenue. And reduce the cost. Add to it here. Uh, well, we're going to wrap. You're going to tell us one minute wrap. How's this? Okay. Uh, let's wrap it up with I want you all to get a chance to talk about how people can reach you and ask questions. Uh, and then one takeaway for this audience. I'm going to, I'll start with I think I just shared it already the Friday afternoon strategy hack. Friday afternoons is when you're going to plan your next week and drop into a really awesome execution on Monday morning. Most of your competitors are planning where they're going to have happy hour. And you're going to outmaneuver and out-execute that. And you can reach me at, sorry, you can reach me at bewellmind.org. And that's all my research and my blog and, and services. Thank you. Oh, hi. And we'll go down, though. Yeah. Uh, so we are specializing in uh, understanding and simplifying emerging tech, uh, be it blockchain, be it uh, distributed AI. Uh, so the key is to understand uh, and this is not just for big organizations anymore, even if it's a, a small business, family office, there are opportunities to run whatever you might have cloud infrastructure costs uh, to be in a much, much effective way going forward. Or it could be how you're handling privacy regulations. On, all In every one of these fronts, these, these technologies are moving at breakneck speed. And these are academically vetted. And uh, there was a research we could share. And... Uh, uh, the, the, the point is to start planning ahead and saying, you know, where are you putting your investments and, and try to have a future-proof and a start-step way of looking at things, and that's where we can help. Uh, Satya at chainaim.com is where you can reach. What's one practical tip? Uh, practical tip. Uh, innovation. Uh, innovation. The, the innovation is a leveling playing field, and your customers are going to hang out in different, ele- in different places than you had anticipated that. Yeah, so, interesting, yeah. 
Excellent. Thank you. Right. Right. So um, basically, you know, if you ever want to sort of expand your markets <laughs> and uh, find new markets and leveraging um, synergies in new markets in the area of business and talent, um, if you're ever looking into the Asia Pacific region, especially in the area of New Zealand, Singapore, Malaysia, do reach out to me. I'm happy to meet all of you here and be able to see how we can strike some synergies and just strike some collaboration as well. So um, the largest takeaway, um, it would be, it would be just one sentence: um, innovation at discovering the limit of possible, going beyond it, and going into the impossible. So if we practice innovation, we can turn possible into the possible. So I can uh, refer you to Esther. She did work with our, uh, with my former company, and uh, help with expansion and growth in, uh, in that region. So uh, somebody you should call. Um, in my book, To Complify, um, I lay out a roadmap for, um, you know, how simplicity drives innovation and transformation. And a lot of the work that I do uh, in advising uh, leadership teams, CEOs, boards, and, and investors is really around that concept. Um, you know, how, how can we, uh, you know, simplify our relationships, simplify our processes, um, and, you know, with our customers, our associates, and our investors. Um, in order to build a great company. Um, as far as an insight or something to leave you with, I, I believe you know, curiosity and asking questions is such an important part of leadership. It's a part of cultures that we have. Uh, we're all taught to answer questions really well. All the way through school, we, we learn to answer. The best answers get best grades. When we go to work, our best answers get us promotion. And when we become leaders, you know, we think we're still problem solvers, and the reality is we are to a certain extent, but asking questions of those around us, asking the people we work with, asking people of, uh, of our customers, our investors, people in the street, really um, adds to that leadership uh, ability and capability. And I think the ability to learn to ask really good questions is uh, an important part of the leadership journey, an important part of innovation. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. I think... Uh, uh, my company is, like I said before, uh, Bob Industries. You can find us on the web at ba-av.com. So if you want to reach out about anything, that would love to hear from you guys. Um, quick tip or, or tidbit is you know, we, we've talked about it all week at all these various different panels. I spent most of my time in the Internet uh, conference. But where we find people, where we find our answers, isn't what it was yesterday. The, yeah. the, 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 the marketplace, and it's been this way for a little bit, like this is not necessarily revolutionary or brand new, but it's out there on the web. It's in social media. Now it's in, in to the VR sphere. It's, you know, that's where we find these things. So we have to be able to start sourcing things in that way. Not everything's going to be in your office. You're not always going to have someone sitting there reviewing the CAD drawing on the conference room table the way we once did, right? And so we have to begin to, you know, Im, you know, evolve into new markets, right? And, and new places where we find our where we find our things that we need that we need to find. And that's what we do really well is we help you sort of evolve into that. Doing things in a more digital, you know, more decentralized, you know, kind of way. One tip, is that you got one tip for the audience? Yeah, no, one, one tip. I, I mean, I think you, your customers have, when you're, you're building into new markets and you're trying to build new stuff, your customers have to know what to look for, you, right? And, and in today's world, if you never stepped into this VR or gamification or a live streaming or any of these kind of things that people are, are all the rage right now, um, you need to be doing it. You need to be out there. So, videos, I mean. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's really like Basically. social media. It's the algorithms. If you're not constantly yeah. posting and constantly getting stuff up there, the algorithms they deprioritize you, and so your the people that that are looking for you have to scroll for significantly longer than they should they should do. So you've yeah. got to keep producing and keep posting it. Which really, I mean, the the secret sauce there is to have a partner that can do that with yeah. you or for you, so that you don't have to spend all of your energy thinking about what are we posting this week? What are we posting today? What are we producing? Yeah. Just bring it apart. You know, oh. The world is so open at this particular moment. All right. Thank you. And yeah. So <clears throat> actually, I'm doing a couple of whatever you guys are talking about. So I was actually motivated and excited. So we said part of posting. So let me go back. So my name is Anil Agarwal, right? So the only thing I had I said when I started Ground Zero was to just find something. I had nothing. So I build up my brand by posting every day. So now on Google, like Anil Agrawal is a very common name. So there are billionaires who, when you Google, 
there is a uh, Vidant uh, Industries, Billionaire, uh, Anil Kapoor, all those. But I, my name somehow comes up number one. So my, I've made myself link Anil Sell. So anywhere in the globe, if any, anyone is typing on a Google page, Anil Sell, my, all the pages talk about me. One, two, three. I, I started using small customers as my piggy bank to market me. They, they could be a millionaire, they could be a billionaire. So I like, I will try my best to get pictures with everyone. And I already started posting content from this conference. It's already getting live. So I created a system where, let's say, if I click a picture of this, it automatically goes to my website, it automatically goes to the Google. So I don't want to leave any chance where someone is missing. So I want people to know me everywhere. I'm using all the social media. <laughs> yeah, so, and the best thing is, I, I'm very good in irritating people too. So I find someone who can irritate me, I make them as a center point of my pain. And I make them as a jumping ground to go and show. Like my pain when I started was my boss who fired me. So every time I was writing an article, I was tagging him, like hashtagging him. Look, that, you know. So I made him so much. And then when I overlapped him, like I surrounded him, like whatever he was doing, I took over all the industry. For example, I learned like he had a restaurant business. So I started my restaurant website and I made it hot delivered. So I bought every restaurant in that neighborhood and I said, look, I will create, I will take your order. You don't need to pay to grab up. You don't need to go to anything. We will get the order on a WhatsApp and we will give you a QR code. So I had a talent in India. I told him he did everything, but they were and made him a partner. So my blessing was like, you keep 80%, give me 20% because my, my goal is not to make money. My goal is to beat my boss. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now what happened, but that company became a big company and someone wanted to, someone was offering us a million dollars to buy that company, hot delivered. They were just on a name. So <laughs> the idea became a necessity because someone was paining me enough. So what I'm trying to say, like I've made myself a pain to gear up. I'm doing what you are talking about. I'm doing what you're talking about, like innovation. You know, when you have a product, gold card, no one wants it. No one wanted me. So I made myself as a product. I said, look, I have to become a product, so I, I no one wanted to see myself. I was like, okay, people know Vincent. I will stand next to him and I will tag. <laughs> Vincent, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Eric, I think the takeaway is yeah. how you have I'm sorry, I have business. to cut you off now. Possible. Vincent, I'm sorry, I have to cut you off now. We're way over. We have an award. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, everyone, for the time. In India. So sorry. Folks, no let's give it up for our panel. Thank you so much. <laughs> if you have a question, please.